Hey, and thanks for listening. This is Conversations, the True Voice Media Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Gibbard. Let's get started. I'm here with a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to make him introduce himself. <laughs> we have Jay Bayer here. Jay, why don't you tell the people listening all about yourself, start to finish. When were you born, and where are you now? I am actually uh, at home today, which is sort of a rare occurrence. I've been on the road a lot lately. I am Jay Bear. Uh, I am a speaker, author, consultant. Uh, I uh, wrote a best-selling uh, new book recently called Utility. Uh, I have a consulting company called Convince and Convert, which works with uh, medium and large organizations all across North America on social media strategy and content marketing strategy. Uh, we have a, a popular blog as well at convinceandconvert.com, and I'm the host of the weekly Social Pros podcast. Oh, but there's so much more. There's the social habit. Uh, from what I understand, you're also an investor in a fair number of really cool companies. So you are you are spreading yourself all across this web doing cool stuff. <laughs> I'm spreading myself thin is what I'm doing, actually, but, uh, but, but I'm doing the best I can. Fair enough, man. That's really cool. Um, well, uh, I wanted to ask you a couple things before we got into – I definitely want to talk a little bit about utility, but I want, I'm actually really curious about – um, sort of your history and how you got into this business, um, just sort of as a, a foundation. This podcast is I get to talk to just people and ask them questions. I'm following in Mitch Joel's sort of format where I just want to ask people things that I really want to ask them. Um, okay. So I got the opportunity to see you speak in New York uh, for the book release party of Utility with yeah. Offer Pop. Very yep. cool. And what I just want to know is how did you get here? What what was the journey that got you to become this content marketing um, and and social media strategy consultant, speaker, et cetera? Well, it was definitely a journey, that's for sure. Um, I started originally in politics. I was a political campaign consultant, and I did that for a little while uh, and then got out of that business and worked in corporate side marketing for a, a short period and then worked very briefly for the government. I was the spokesperson for the Department of Juvenile Corrections in Arizona. So my job was to give tours uh, of the uh, youth prison, which is not even as fun as I just made it sound. Uh, and I really hated that job. Um, and but partially just because it was, you know, kind of a weird place to begin with, but but also just the government, the sort of nature of government work, which can be somewhat, uh, you know, it, it takes a long time to get things done there, right? Yeah. Uh, and and they put me in charge of a thirteen person business card redesign committee. And I thought, you know, if it's going to take us thirteen people to make this happen, this might not be the right corporate culture for me. <laughs> so. I, uh, meanwhile, my, two of my friends from college, University of Arizona, had started the very first internet company in Arizona. And we were having beers one night, and they said, hey, um, this internet thing uh, that we're doing is starting to take off, and we don't know anything about marketing. And I said, well, that's good, because when you say the word internet, I don't know what it is that you mean. I don't know what that is. This is like 93. Mm-hmm. So I said, but you know what? I'll do anything other than one more day in this job. So I quit. Uh, I quit uh, my government job. I went to go work for uh, them as a vice president of sales and marketing at an internet company without ever having been on the internet, which was an interesting uh, first day of work. Um, so I spent uh, some time there and, and then helped build that company and uh, it became real successful and then have started or managed five other uh, internet based services companies since then with convince and convert being the most recent. So it's been a, it's been a long period of time. I've always been a writer. I used to write, uh, magazine articles and I've always been a speaker and I've always done speaking locally and regionally. And, and just in the, the last few years, it's just gotten bigger to the point where instead of writing magazine articles, you're writing books. And instead of speaking in your, you know, in your town, you're speaking all over the world. And it's been a, it's been a, uh, Chris Brogan says it best. Um, you know, it took 20 years to be an overnight sensation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny. I so I'm, I listened to the sort of that towards the end of that story, and it's looking a little bit like the middle of my story right now. So you know, I'm I started doing speaking um, very locally, and then it started to kind of branch out, and now I'm traveling a little bit. Uh, I've been blogging since 2008, and now I'm thinking, okay, how do I write my first book? How do I go about doing it? And um, you know, I got to say, utility. Uh, when I read that, it, I felt like that was the point where I. You, you kind of gave me freedom to, to feel like I could write a book because right. what you did in utility that I, I just want to appreciate is that you were able to 
very concisely. I mean, it's not a long book, but no. you pack in that in those pages. You just like knock it out of the park in those pages. You're like, here's everything you need to know. Here's a framework. Here's you know. Let me break it down simply for you. Get through this book, and you'll be smarter on the other end. So that really gave me the freedom to say, well, I don't need to write War and Peace. I don't need to, like, write the social media Bible to put out something valuable. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And, and I'll tell you, um, thank you. Uh, it, that was very intentional. So all of that was was very much planned. Um, you know, I get sent books every single day. Um, from authors and publishers who want me to review the book or talk about it on my podcast or whatever, which is or great. Write the blurb or something. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, free books. Um, but it's hard to read a whole book these days, yeah. um, not just for me, but for a lot of people. And and if you think about sort of content marketing and content consumption trends in general, with more and more people um, consuming little snackable size pieces of information, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or short videos or Instagram video or, or you know, doing more things on a mobile device. This idea that you're going to take this big thing uh, and either in hardcover or Kindle or Nook or what have you, uh, and, and you're going to consume 285 pages of a business book, you know, some people will do that, but, but I think it's, it's against trend. So I very intentionally wrote uh, Utility to be shorter. Uh, the book itself, the actual physical book is, I'll show you, hold on a second, um, is actually smaller than, um, it's actually cut smaller. It's intentionally trimmed smaller um, than business books. So here's my first two books, and you can see. Yeah. Right? So it's actually intentionally smaller, so it feels easier to read. And there's also no jacket on the book, right? So, which also I think makes it feel a little easier, a little more accessible. So the, the reason I wrote it this way was I wanted people to be able to grab this book and say, oh, yeah, I could knock this out in one sitting or I could knock this out in one plane flight. Yeah. Uh, and just make it not feel like a slog. And, and, um, and that element of it's been real successful. Yeah, well, clearly you've succeeded because, you know, I invited you to come on this podcast. And I was like, shit, I've got to read his book so I know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> and uh, I picked it up and I was like, oh, I can knock this thing out. And that's basically what happens. I sat down. I just like, I mean, not only that, it's a page turner. Like, you can nice. definitely get through the book. But, um, you know, it's not long. It's very, it, you know, it's very, very digestible. And, in fact, um, you know, I just before I got on the call with you, uh, the, did the intro to this. And, um, and, and I, I basically said, you know, Jay makes it very relatable, which I think is something um, – that you and I have in common, it's something I respect, is that you you don't talk over people's heads or get into, like, you know, the vernacular that goes way above what people can understand and talk about, I don't know, galvanizing people and, like, just say what you mean. Just put it out there. Um, but you said something really interesting just now that I it, – it's a question I want to ask you about utility, and um, it, it comes back to this content marketing. There's more content, and look at the trends and more noise. And your book, Utility, which um, I think I should probably let you set up um, as you answer this question, but what happens when there's a saturation of utility? What happens when – what if all of these companies that – you know, everybody reads your book, right? Everybody gets into this. Everybody gets into the idea of utility. Now we're saturated with helpfulness. How do you then – what happens next? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, the premise of utility is that it's marketing so useful – that people would pay for it, that it's marketing that has intrinsic value, that has value unto itself. It's, it's marketing as a service or marketing as a product. Um, and many, many companies are starting to do this. I chronicle uh, lots of them in the book, but, but even since the book came out, which is just three months ago, there's been tons and tons of new examples. People send them to me now, which is really cool. Um, I was thinking you should have like a delicious bookmark just I actually have, or something. I have the good ones that I really like, I add to the website, to the utilitybook.com website. There's a section there called New Utilities, and I keep adding links there. Yeah, you should use like Ift or something and track delicious and all the yeah. other things that people tag and see if you can just chronicle like a giant mass of yeah. them. It's good idea. Um, and it was funny you, you asked that question because I was at Content Marketing World two weeks ago, and Tom Webster, um, who I actually worked with on the Social Habit Research Project that you mentioned at the open of the show, Tom Webster is uh, vice president for Edison Research. He's a terrific blogger and thought leader, really, really good guy, smart guy. 
And he and his wife, Tamsin, gave a presentation at Content Marketing World about that exact question. What happens when everybody's doing this, right? So right now what you have is a market inefficiency, right? You have consumers that are desiring more useful content, more helpful content, more utilities, and you have a relatively small number of companies that are providing that, that are filling that gap. Once that gap is, is totally full and you can't exploit those market inefficiencies, uh, then, then what happens? And and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've, I've been thinking about it, but I don't know the answer. To that Tom has some thoughts on it um, about what happens next. I think to some degree it's interesting what Google has done in the last week or two. Yep. Uh, the Hummingbird release and, and hiding uh, search terms now, keeping all searches private, things like that. That That's making content marketing... Mm, perhaps less linear and and less sort of a arbitrage money ball kind of game and and more hey you just have to have great content uh, and it's got to be great enough that people will spread it uh, on their own you can't necessarily say here's the search term that we're trying to match this content up with uh, it's just got to be good enough to to live on its own i think that's actually a good thing from a utility standpoint but you're right at some point there's going to be somebody who does the ultimate blog or whatever in every category uh, and and then what yeah um, i'm not certain yeah and then there's sort of this like early in thing going on which you know you were very early in on twitter and you know i, I think all of those that got very early in on twitter you can clearly see that their following is is representative of getting in early i think google plus right now is that kind of open space where people can get right. in early if it if it you know really matures and grows as i think it will there's a huge opportunity there and then Great. once they become saturated, there's just those people that are established. So, um, you know, these – if we get to the point where there's all of this utility and there's all of this um, content out there, it makes you think what happens next is it's the relationships, the people that you go as your definitive trusted sources yep. or that others trust. Um, so that's kind of to your point about what's happening with uh, with Google. I think one of the other things that, that is going to happen – uh, you know, a lot of the definitive places now are primarily written, you know, are, are blogs or things along yeah. those lines. And, and as content consumption continues to shift toward multimedia, uh, whether it's podcasts or videos, et cetera, um, I feel like you have an opportunity to say, well, yeah, somebody else has this covered in writing, but we're going to cover it in video. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I think that is sort of a secondary opportunity, at least, uh, in the short and midterm, right? That, that there will be two winners in every category. There'll be the the winner in writing and the winner in pictures. Yeah, or in video or in audio or whatever it might be. And then when you think about things like Google Glass coming into the into the fray, and then you've got you know sort of the contextual overlay of our world, then there's winning in that space as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, you know, there, there will be a time when when utility at the local level, at least, is defined by augmented reality, right? How who can be the best source of information as I'm walking around. Um, now, I tend to think that Google itself will be the winner most of the time. Yeah. Uh, they kind of have <laughs> some actual advantages there. And who they're uh, investing in shows that they're very, very clearly trying to get to the next phase of things. They're not worried yeah. about what has been. They're looking at what will be. Yeah, no question. Right on, man. So you said something when I saw you speak I want to I wanna ask you about because I'm not sure I agree with you on it. So I, I want to hash it out with you because I think it's interesting. You said that you think that websites will become the AM radio of, of the Internet essentially and that apps are the new thing. The appification of um, the web is, is mm-hmm. kind of where things are going. We're moving yeah. towards more unique experiences, device-centric experiences, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you, but at the same time, I think what we we might be on opposite sides and we might meet in the middle. I think that yep. websites are going to continually evolve, and they're going to meet somewhere in the middle with apps. They'll just need to essentially adapt to, to meet the experience of the person based on where they are and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but tell me, tell me more about what you think about this appification and the, the specifically the AM radio of the web. I, I should make sure that we're clear that that's not my quote, nor is it necessarily uh, my original perspective. George Colony, who's the CEO of Forrester Research, okay. was the one who originally coined the phrase appification and is also the one who is credited with the quote that websites will be the AM radio of the Internet. Uh, I agree with George, but it's not it's not my okay. uh, it's not my statement. So Fair I just enough. Wanna, I don't, I don't Apologies to but, George. <laughs> um, I think there's two things about where we're going that makes me really bullish on apps. Um, maybe three things. One, one is that 
The problem with websites is that they have to do lots of things, right? Every website out there has to serve a lot of masters uh, and fulfill a lot of premises, right? You've got to have new customer information, current customer information, you know, job seeker information, a bunch of other stuff. And, and consequently, you, you're trying to do 12 things. Uh, and you do none of them particularly well in most cases because they all have to be as part of that um, operation. Whereas an app can focus on doing one or two things uh, and doing those one or two things particularly well and not have all the other kind of shenanigans going on there and getting in the way from a usability perspective and navigation perspective. Um, so so the, the purposeful nature of apps, I think, makes them much, much easier to use in comparison to your average site. Um, also, when you think about the vast majority of the world that is mobile only, right, that, that is only operated in a mobile environment, there is no desktop, there is no tablet, et cetera, um, the ability to... Uh, push information and use push notifications and other things, the, the bandwidth and connectivity advantages of apps versus a straight site, I think will become more of an issue uh, in the second world and in the third world, which will tend to, to make apps more important, certainly in that part of the world. Um, and then I just feel like, you know, if you remember where AOL was, right, mid-90s, where you've had this intriguing, colossal millions and millions and millions, tens of millions of Americans who were really getting involved in the internet uh, for the first time. And they embraced America Online because what it did is it took away all the nonsense, right? It was like, look, the open web is scary. What we're going to do is sanitize this for your protection, uh, and we're going to have a fixed number of options here. You want sports? You click on the big button that says sports. You know, you want shopping? You click on the big button that says shopping. Um, Between the cacophony of websites that are out there, uh, the phishing scams, the privacy issues, we're getting back to that point where the open Internet is scary and dangerous, uh, and I think apps is going to solve that that fear and danger issue for a lot of people. Now, obviously, your early adopters, your technology um, aptitude crowd are not going to embrace uh, apps instead of sites, but that is the exception, not the rule, right? You start, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned about utility is, look, yeah, I do a lot of serious consulting and and work for a lot of companies on what's the future. But when I think about those issues, I think about what does my mom want, not what do I want. I always say the I'm, exact I'm not, same I'm not thing. the audience, right? Yeah. yeah, I always say the exact same thing. Can my mom use this? If my yeah. mom can't use it, it's probably not easy enough. Um, yeah. So what's interesting about that, though, is that – and and I'm totally going to use the Tom Webster sample size of one here mm-hmm. – um, in my experience, it's it's people like us that have phones that are loaded with apps, and most of the people I know are very, very – they use the default apps and things. They're not really yeah. going out and getting new ones. Um, but what what I, I think I'm, when I look at websites and I think about exactly what you're saying, that they do a lot of things but they don't do them well, do you think there's an opportunity then for websites to become more like platforms that host apps, sort of like your phone has an operating system – and then instead, websites become more of a platform that hosts their apps. Yeah, potentially. And I think what's really exciting about that uh, and what could save websites is if that happens automatically, right? If, if, if the website is smart enough to pull context out of your previous behaviors and say, look, um, when you come to the site, they're, they're just going to serve up this thing that they know you want. You, you know, We know what you want to do, so let's just serve this up and strip away all the rest of it, you know? Mm-hmm. But, but websites in general, right, are, are crazy. The whole thing is crazy. Uh, you know, and I started in this business before there was Yahoo, before there was even a browser. Um, but if you said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create the most popular technology in the history of the world. But what we're going to do is set it up so that every time you go to any individual node in the most popular technology ever, you have to relearn the wayfinding system that that particular node has determined is yeah. what they're going to do, right? So, I mean, imagine if, uh, and this is this is the an apt analogy, I believe. Imagine you go to your newsstand, right, and you pick up a magazine, and every magazine you pick up has a different page numbering scheme. This one's all odd numbers. This one's only prime numbers, right? This one, you know, it, and, and because everybody's website navigates the same way, organizes, or differently, I should say, uh, navigates differently, organizes information differently, uh, set up differently, 
it, it's crazy. It is it is the it is the most ridiculous set of circumstances imaginable. But here we are, right? We've evolved into this. Um, you know, imagine if every TV show was a different length too. You know, and you're starting to see that a little bit in Netflix. Mm-hmm. But what's Netflix? It's a series of apps. Yeah. It's a series of apps. It's television as app is what it is. Interesting. Okay. I think I can see your perspective here. I like it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about utility. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. Um, figure we could talk a little bit about your book because it's sure. awesome. Um, so in your book, you, you go over there are three facets um, that make up this, um, this utility movement. Uh, the self-serve yeah. information, radical transparency, and real-time relevancy, mm-hmm. all of which I fully buy into, I fully get. Um, do you think that there's also sort of an underpinning that those are things that then – are layered on top of a more human and connected business sort of that once you get past the self-serve, you need somebody to be able to call and really connect with them and have that experience instead of walking through those voicemail systems and crap like that. Do you think that that's an important element of utility being successful? Um, I've never been asked that before. I, I think it is ideal but not required, right? So my first book, The Now Revolution, was I read that very good book. Thanks. Was all about humanization of business and and the kind of things that you describe. I do not believe that that utility and humanization uh, have to be lockstep. I mean, certainly, what I would tell you is that from a cultural standpoint, as somebody who works with corporations on these issues, it, it's probably no surprise that companies that have a culture of empowerment of employees and a culture of, hey, the customer's usually right and, and let's you know put the customer first, are, are, are the type of companies that are both human and useful. Shocking. Uh, that, yeah, just sort of, you know, and that's what I always tell people, right? You know, they always say that, that the internet is this great, um, you know, leveling uh, device, right? That, that anybody can compete and, and you can disintermediate big companies and, and that's true to a degree, but what it's, what's even more true is that the rich get richer. Right? If you're a good company, all the technology changes and consumer behavior changes that we're undergoing just allow you to be an even better company. Yep. And if you're a shitty company, you just get shittier faster. Yeah. Um, right? And so I really believe we're, 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 it's not going to be a digital – it's not going to be so much a digital divide, although there is a digital divide, of course. But, but it's just a good company divide, right? Yeah. I mean, you have these two, you know, two sides of the business. You're either really good – or you're really bad, uh, and, and I think what the internet is doing is taking away your ability to be a mediocre company. Um, you're either going to be great or you're going to be terrible. Um, but to your original question, I do not believe that you have to be human to do utility. And in fact, because of one of the key premises of utility is that relationships can now be created with information. That information, of course, needs to be credible and useful and human. But but I don't believe you have to put the actual person. Uh, side of it together. Now, that usually happens, but I don't think it's required. Gotcha. So even though people are doing 60% of their research before they ever, you know, they know it before they even call the the company or anything, you still think that there's that additional 40% where it's not necessary to have uh, an employer or a person or a touch point or, uh, uh, you know, in the company, it helps, but it's not necessary is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. And that's, and that's in B2B in particular, but I think, I think the difference is not necessarily having a massively transformed uh, humanization program, but instead it's having a sales team, for example, that fully recognizes that prospects have secret shopped them to death before they ever call. Mm -hmm. And so when that person calls the salesperson, the first question out of the salesperson's mouth uh, isn't, uh, what do you know about us? They already assume that they know a bunch of things. It's what specific question do you have that you haven't had answered yet, right? So it's 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 understanding uh, circumstantial relevance and and respecting the fact that your prospective customers have probably already done a lot more research than you think. Interesting. So so let me ask you a question about this because this is one – I've recommended your book to a number of people because I think that it makes a very uh, – you're welcome. I, I think it makes a very good um, – you make a very good argument. You make it very clearly. You make it very concisely. But it's still 100 and some odd page, 150, 160 pages, mm-hmm. something like that. And if I'm trying to sell one of my clients on the idea of utility, um, 
I have to figure out how to do that in less than a hundred and some odd pages. I have to yep. be able to clearly communicate to them. Um, why should we be doing this? And to your point that you make very early on in the book is that this is flipping marketing on its head. It's not what we've typically seen out of marketing departments. Not at all. If they've been used to doing, you know, if they've been in business for 20 years or something, they're used to advertising. They're used to PR. They're used to all of these things that are primarily immeasurable, that are in many ways secretive. They're very controlled. They're all of these things. How do you make the case for utility clearly and concisely to a CEO or a CMO that doesn't get this shit? Yeah. Well, that's why I use so many examples, both in the book and in my live presentation. I'm always talking about examples, and I write up new ones on the blog all the time. Uh, even if it's not an example from your exact industry, um, I, I think when you start to demonstrate what can be done uh, in the world of utility and useful marketing, it, it helps people understand Oh, we could do that as well. I mean, I did a, I did a presentation this week for a big corporation, a very specific type of business, and so I didn't have any examples for their category necessarily. I just don't know of any. But I had a bunch of other examples um, from other types of companies, but but that totally resonated with them. Like, oh, we gotta we gotta totally change what we're doing. We have to fundamentally reconfigure the way we think about marketing. So the nice thing is that there's more and more examples out there, right? Every day, and more companies are starting to do this, and you have to just pull those examples out and and uh, and put them in front of uh, the CEO or CMO in question. Now, what I'll tell you though is, despite the fact that my company is called Convince and Convert, um, I always find it usually a fool's errand to try and convince or convert. Um, You know, you have to give people the raw materials to help them understand that marketing has changed, but you can't convince somebody that marketing has changed. They will eventually figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. And once it becomes their idea, um, then they're really excited about it. Once it's, when, when it's just your idea and you're trying to force them to change the way they think, It's difficult. Almost never works. Fair enough. That's completely true. Yeah, you kind of have to get them to, like, walk through the process themselves. Whenever I'm talking about search with someone, I always ask them questions to get them to experience it and feel it so then they can really go through it. So so probably you could, depending on the circumstance, you could find relevant examples and then walk your client or prospect through that to, to say, well, how do you go about finding this? Well, don't you see that's what they're doing here? Yes, absolutely. Excellent idea. All right, well, Jay, I want to be sensitive to your time, but before you go, uh, I, want to, I want to ask you just a couple quick other things. One, I want to know what you're reading, who you respect, what blogs you're checking out, where you get your information from, um, so that not only you know, the people who are listening, but you know, myself included, I want to know, sure. you know where you're sourcing stuff from. Sure. So there's a you know a bunch of different blogs that I read depending on what uh, I'm looking for. So I read a lot of blogs from a news perspective, right? What's going on uh, inside Facebook, inside Twitter, social media today, social media uh, examiner, um, social fresh, um, you know, TechCrunch, Read Right Web, that that whole sort of sphere of. Do you still of, read like, Mashable? Uh, I look at the headlines, uh, and I don't click through too many, but every once in a while I do. Um, so I took, take a look at, at those stuff, just kind of know what's going on today. Then there's a, a sort of second group of blogs, um, that I, that I look at in terms of sort of trend and, and, you know, insights kind of thing. So Tom Webster's blog and Mark Schaefer's blog and Mitch Joel and Chris Penn and, uh, a number of other people that, uh, I, I follow Brian Solis and Jeremiah Aoyang and a lot of other uh, friends there. So. Uh, I look at those groups, and then I and then I do read a lot of books, um, and and so I usually have four or five uh, stacked up at at any given time. Uh, there's a new Ian Greenlee's new book, um, Social Media Side Door, is is really good. Uh, Michael Brito's uh, new book coming up. I gotta uh, read that one. You're, Everybody's you're, a media company, company. right? Yep, yeah. that's out. And um, there's there's a there's a, Tom Martin has a great new book coming out about. Uh, social media, uh, inbound marketing, and sales. So there's there's probably six or seven really strong books coming out this fall that I'm really excited about from people that I uh, that I know and support. Um, my good friend Joe Palizzi's new book, uh, Epic Content Marketing, just came out uh, last week, and it's it's amazing. It's really really strong. Right. So it's, it's fun to always um, pick up on 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 those kind of trends, and especially when it's people that I've had the chance to meet in the past or speak with or work with. It's nice to see. Um, nice to see those folks putting out great books. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sort of just a quick follow up of that. What's your technology choice? Are you reading like paper books? Or are you a Kindle guy? As far as your uh, blogs, are you email subscriber, RSS, Twitter? Yeah, great question. So I am, um, you know, I'm I'm old. So <laughs> that's how I. Um, 
so I used to do RSS, but got out of the habit. And so I, if, if it's a blog I really care about, I subscribe to email because I'm, I check my email a lot, right? So that way it's, I know I'm going to see it, uh, whether or not I, I consume it depends, but, but I know I'm going to see it. So I subscribe to blogs via email. Um, I, while I have a Kindle and I love it, I almost always read hardcover. Um, mm-hmm. And here's why. I read most of my books in the 10,000 feet before the, the ding and after the ding uh, on planes, which is every single week. So yep. uh, that, that's, you know, when I can't have electronics on, that's when I read those books. And that's why I have hardcover because it fills that, that time window. Yep. Um, so that's typically the way, the way that deal works. And then the other thing I should say is I get, I get a lot out of, out of our podcast, Social Pros. You know, every week we interview somebody who's a social media manager, content marketing manager, typically from a major brand. And uh, I learn a lot from those conversations because you really get a sense of what people are, are, are doing you know, really in the trenches. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's a very educational show for me. Yeah, it's a great podcast, man. The one you did with Matt Ridings was like... Oh yeah, he was amazing, dude. That guy is so awesome. He is super smart. Huge super fan of him. Smart. And yeah. actually, that was the second one. Uh, you know, we recorded one with Matt, and I screwed it up, and it didn't record. Uh, and so we had to redo the whole show, which totally sucked. Awesome. Well, that was the second take. That was the second. That take. was a kick-ass second take, man. Yeah. Way to go! Thanks. I felt pretty bad. I'm like, and we had to do it like three weeks later too, because everybody was busy. So I was yeah. like, oh yeah, he's it's a uh, there's a nightmare, right? You like lose the whole show. I'm like, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, well, that must be fun. You get to talk to really cool people. I'm, I'm actually hoping that this podcast gets to continue in this vein where I get to talk to people like yourself. And yeah. uh, uh, last week I spoke with Marcus Nelson, um, which I know you're, you're involved in Advocate, right? Uh, yes, that's right. I'm uh, uh, on their board, as a matter of fact. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping that mine gets to be the same sort of thing because I, I found I've learned so much when I get to just chat with people like yourself yeah. and, and others. Um, so uh, last thing is uh, tell people where they can go and find out more about you, more about the book, where they can be social with you, uh, you all that sort of stuff. Thanks. Lots of places. Uh, the book is at utilitybook.com. Uh, there's a, a juicy free excerpt there, too. So if people are uncertain whether they want to buy the book, you can go there and uh, read 15 pages or so from the middle and make that decision. Uh, there's a bunch of other free resources there as well. And then our blog and me and all that is uh, convinceandconvert.com. Uh, Excellent. I'll be sure to put those both in the uh, in the blog post uh, that will accompany this podcast. I appreciate um, it. Where else would uh, – if anybody wanted to connect with you, ask you a question, tell you that you're fantastic, where, where would they do that? What's best yeah, for you? Uh, probably easiest is Twitter. I'm at Jay Bear. Okay, cool. And I'll put that in the blog post as well. Thanks. Well, Jay, thank you so much for being on this podcast and entertaining my questions and chatting with me. And also thank you for writing Utility. It's a great book. I highly recommend everyone pick it up. Um, so thanks again. Keep doing the great work, and, and we'll stay connected, all right? Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Take care, man. Cheers. Peace.